Last lesson, we looked at t tests to either reject or accept a null hypothesis. This time, we're going to be looking at chi-squared tests. And also at the end, we're going to quickly go over correlation analysis, which you should be very familiar with from GCSE Maths and Science. So what do chi-squared tests do? Well, a chi-squared test is used when you're comparing observed frequency of things or observed numbers uh, using experimental data compared to the expected frequency that you've made in your hypothesis. Now, what on earth does that mean? Well, the best way to explain it is by showing you two examples. So here's the first example I've chosen. And this is comparing colour blindness in males and females. So theory suggests that it's expected that 5% of the population will be colourblind. So I want to see whether there's a difference between male and female populations. So my null hypothesis would be there is no difference between the occurrence of colour blindness in the male and female population. So what they did is they tested 500 males and 500 females, so 1,000 in all in their sample. And they discovered that 37 males and only 13 females were colourblind. So from these results, is there a significant difference between the occurrence of colour blindness in males and females? Well, first thing, it's helpful to put a table together like this, where you've got the number of colour blind males, the number of colour blind females, and you've got the observed frequency, the number, and expected frequency. So if we have a look, our observed frequency is 37 males and 13 females. Now we have to calculate our expected frequency. And our expected frequency was 5%. So we had 500 males. So 5% 5 of 500 is just 500 times 0 0.05. So that's 25 males we'd expect to have colour blindness. The percentage is the same for both our expected frequency because we're saying there's no difference. So we had 500 females. So that'd be 25 as well for females. And now we do the chi-squared test. Now, to get your chi-squared value, what you do is you take the observed frequency minus expected frequency, square it, and then divide by the expected frequency for each column. And then you sum those columns together. And we also need to calculate the degrees of freedom. So that is the number of columns of data minus one. And um, we've only got two columns of data for male and female, so that's two minus one is one degrees of freedom. So next step, is working out this row here, which is our observed minus expected squared divided by E. So for the males, we have 37 is the observed, minus 25 is the expected, square that, divide by the expected 25, gives us 5.76. If you do the same with the females, believe it or not, quite a coincidence, but we get exactly the same value because the difference between 37 minus 25 is the same as the difference between 13 and minus 25. But that's not always the case. So now to calculate the critical value for our degrees of freedom. And our critical value for our degrees of freedom at 5% is 3.84, and at 1% it's 6.64. So let's find out what our chi-squared value is. So we've got to sum up these two. And we get 5.76 plus 5.76 gives 11.52, which you can see is clearly much larger than 5% confidence and still a lot, lot larger than 1% confidence. So our chi-squared value of 11.52 is much greater than the critical value of 6.64 for 1%. So we can say with a confidence of 99% that there is a significant difference between the occurrence of colour blindness in males compared with females, and therefore we can reject the null hypothesis. So let me give you just one more example before you practice questions yourself. It says, a genetic model suggests that if a red tropical flower self-pollinates, the expected outcome of red, pink and yellow flowers is in the ratio of one red to three pink to two yellow. So a botanist grew 300 plants from the self-pollinated seeds of the tropical plant. Of the flowers he grew, 45 were red, 160 were pink, and 95 were yellow. So our hypothesis is that there should be no difference between the observed frequency and the expected frequency. If that's the case, that genetic model is correct.
So let's look at the table results and put the values in and see. So we had 45 red was the observed, we had 160 pink, and we had 95 yellow. Now we have to calculate the expected frequency using the model. And this is a ratio of 1, 3 to 2. So altogether that's 6. So 1 in 6 of them should be red. So we've got 300 times 1 in 6. We should have 50 red. For the pink, we've got 3 out of 6. So that's a half. So we should have 300 times 3 over 6 is 150. And finally, for yellow, it's 2 out of 6, which is a third. So that's going to be 100. So that's our expected frequency. We now calculate the chi-squared test by first of all working out these for each of the columns. So the observed was 45, minus 50 the expected, squared divided by the expected 50 gives us 0 0.5. If we do that for the other two, we get that all together. And of course the chi-squared value is all those three added together. Now our degrees of freedom are the columns of data minus one. We've got three columns of data, red, pink and yellow, so it's going to be three minus one, which is degrees of freedom two. So if I look at the confidence values, and I'm going to do a five percent confidence on this, so if I look at the confidence values, we're looking for a critical value of 5.99. So our chi-squared value is each of those added together, which comes to 1.42. And that chi-squared value of 1.42 is much less than the critical value of 5.99. So we accept the null hypothesis, which means there's no significant difference between the observed data, or the observed frequency, and the expected frequency. So the botanist can accept the genetic model with a confidence of 95%. So we've looked at the chi-square test, we're just going to quickly look at correlation analysis. Now, when we're talking about correlation, we're looking at is there a relationship between what we plot on our x-axis and what we plot on our y-axis, and how strong is that relationship, that correlation. So here we can see that there's no correlation between either days. There's no link at all as far as we know. Now, these are all positive correlations, which means when x increases, y increases, and your best fit line has a positive slope. Now, of course, you can change your confidence of the uh, correlation depending on how good it is. So this is a low positive correlation. Um, I wouldn't be too happy with that link. This is a high positive correlation. So I could look at that and say, within a little bit of uncertainty, I'm pretty sure that as x increases, y increases, and there's clearly a link. And of course, this is a perfect correlation where they're all on the best fit line. But these are very close. So a strong correlation is when most of the data points are close to the line of best fit. Of course, as well as positive correlation, you can get negative correlation, which means as x increases, y decreases, and exactly the same. The first one, I wouldn't have too much confidence with that relationship. I'll be pretty confident with that relationship because it's got a high negative correlation. And this, I'll be exceptionally confident with that relationship because all the points are on the best fit line. So that's a perfect negative correlation.